important than that, you're our Lord. And so, Father, we just come before you once more to hear a word from you, to hear your instructions in order to be obedient in this life. So, Father, we just pray tonight that you would meet us in a personal way, displaying yourself, yes, as Lord over all the universe, but making it personal for us here tonight. And so, Lord, we just lift our souls to you, that you would bless us, that you would speak to us and guide us through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you turn and greet your neighbors? Once again. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 44. We're going to be picking up at verse 24. It's where we left off last Sunday. And we've been looking at how God has been revealing himself to a disobedient nation. God has desired throughout all of history to use instruments to glorify his name. And so God has chosen Israel as his instrument. He uses creation as his instrument. He uses you and I, and we need to understand that. We need to take that personal, and that when God wants to meet a hurting person, he uses a born-again believer to achieve that purpose. When God sees somebody that needs encouragement, he uses a a born-again believer in order to achieve that purpose. But what happens? What happens when God's people are no longer obedient, when they're no longer have an ear to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. Well, Jesus spoke of that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Have we lost our flavor? Are we still on fire for the Lord? Are we still excited about being used by the Lord? Are we still passionate about the things of God and and how God has been passionate about us? These are things that we need to periodically check our heart that we would know that we are in the will of God. As far as the instrument, God, well, certain places in the Scripture, the tool that God uses is, well, He's used a donkey. He would use rocks to cry out if necessary. He still uses creation to glorify Himself that we would look at the details of creation from the microscope to the telescope and truly see the hand of God. He used a heathen nation to bring correction to his people, and that's what we're looking at here in Isaiah. Because God's people no longer really have a heart. They've gone after false gods, and the most common, yet the most worst, the most worst, the worst false god that man can possibly worship is the human intellect. It's the what I think. What I think, especially when what I think flies in face of what the Lord has to say. And so Israel, again, they're very far from God, and so God is going to set them on the sidelines for, for about 70 years. He's going to allow them to go into Babylonian captivity for the purpose of correction for those 70 years. And at the end of that 70 years, He's going to bring them back into I was going to say back into operation, back into use. He's going to achieve it by his instrument. So, amazing thing. 150 years, that's about where we're at with Isaiah right now. Before he does it, he names both the king and the nation. We've heard of this three times already in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 41, verses 2 through 5 chapter 41, verse 25, and chapter 43, verse 14. And we know, we know because of what the Scripture said, because of what God said beforehand, and what history, how history showed that this played out, that the nation is Babylon and the king is Cyrus, a successor to King Nebuchadnezzar. But nonetheless, God said that he was going to do it before he did it, and it came to pass. In the book of Daniel, chapter 9, God told us the date that Jesus was going to achieve his triumphal entry, and he did it. And God tells us these things beforehand, so once again, you would know that this isn't a club. 
you would, you, you would know that these aren't just some nice stories, that this just is an inspirational speech or whatever it might be, but these are truths from God who has his hands upon the pulse of history, and that we would know that and understand that, and, and because of that, that God's word would become an integral part of our lives, that it would truly inspire us. So in Isaiah day, there is that problem that has arisen and even coming to fruition, idolatry. And really, it's a twofold issue. From God's perspective, he tells us in Isaiah 48, verse 11, I will not give my glory to another. God will not give his glory to another. And why is that? Is it just because he desires the glory? It is because he desires the glory, but he understands the futility of a false god. And he knows man, as man worships his intellect, he knows where that is going to lead man. It's going to lead man to the path of destruction. But it's also an issue from man's perspective. You look at, in chapter 44, look at verses 15 through 16. We saw it last week. It says, speaking of man as he fashions his false gods, then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it on the fire, and with the half he eats meat. He roasts the roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And so the point here is, these things that man fashions and he worships, it's going to be ash. It's going to be ash. It's all going to be ash. And even if it's the human intellect, one day it will be ash. Last night I started watching on the internet Frontline. Frontline is a, I think it's a PBS, um, it's not a station, but it's a PBS special that they do every so often, and they have documentaries. And I watched a documentary on um, football players and the damage that football is doing to their brains. And it was interesting, they had a couple neurosurgeons. As a matter of fact, they were a big part of the show, and they were looking at brains. They had a brain there. And actually, they showed this delivery guy, FedEx, coming in, and they were, FedEx was delivering a brain to them. You can have a brain delivered right to your front door, apparently. But no, they were doing that. These were football players who had died, and they contact the family because they're doing this research, because we've seen where this has become a commonality, football players dealing with Parkinson's and all kinds of dementia, and so they're dissecting their brains, and they're finding these proteins that come from trauma injuries and, and all of these things. But one of the things that they said that I thought was kind of interesting is they were, you know, they were showing this delivery. It was staged, but they were taking this brain out of, out of the box that it came in and whatnot. And, and they said that they're very respectful of this, and they're, they understand that this is the core of, of who these people were. And I'm just thinking, I understand where they're coming from, but the core of a person is the spirit that communes with God. And until we see that, until we understand it, yeah, the brain, you know what's going to happen to the brain? It's going to turn to ash at some point. I was going to say it's going to burn, well, if they cremate it, it's going to deteriorate. Either way, ends up the same way, it's going to turn to ash. And so everybody that has depended upon, you know, I'm not trying to be graphic, but depended upon that, that brain, well, they took the brain out of the body, and guess what happened? Even before that, the body was dead. And that brain can only do so much for that person's body. But again, it's the, it's the spirit of that person that continues to commune with God. We looked at 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, and it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, all of creation will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And so you can take that and bring it back to Isaiah's day. Since everything is going to burn, since born-again believer or not, we're going to stand before a holy God. Everything we see is going to be gone, and that being the case standing before a holy God, what kind of person ought you to be? What kind of person ought I to be today? Well, the Bible tells me, at the very least, to be an obedient, faithful servant of the living God. 
and I shouldn't even say the very least, because in actuality, that's the very most. So what we're seeing in this section of Isaiah is the biblical fact. If you place someone or something in the place of God, he's going to give you some time off to come to your senses. He's going to give you some time off to contemplate these things, to see what life is like apart from God. So to achieve his purpose, we're going to be looking at three parts of God's plan in the remainder of chapter 44 and through to chapter 45. And the first thing that we see, God's plan, he brings this instrument into the equation. This instrument, well, he's authorizing Cyrus here. Chapter 44, verse 24 to the end of the chapter, and thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. So notice that God, even though he's allowing Israel to go into Babylonian captivity, even though he's going to allow you to go into hardship of some sort or whatever it might be, he is your Redeemer. Again, that which was formerly headed for destruction, a price was paid and it has been brought back. It has been redeemed. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he forms you from the womb. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of the babblers and drives diviners mad, speaking of the cult, who turns wise men backward and make their knowledge foolishness, who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited, to the cities of Judah you shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. He says to Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all of my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. So again, this is being said 150 years before Cyrus even came into existence. God is speaking these things, and so putting yourself in the place of the Jew, as you're hearing these things, you're thinking, what? God's got great promises here through Jerusalem. And he's talking about it being rebuilt, but there's the temple, and here's the city. Because it was so far beyond the Jew that God would allow Jerusalem to be conquered, to be sacked, and the temple to be destroyed. Matter of fact, Instead of being humbled by it, they were very arrogant because of it. And so God, he needed to do this work. Well, we know that Nebuchadnezzar, the one who led Babylon in the destruction of Jerusalem, was God's tool, in, the tool in God's hand. There's going to be this man, as far as for the restoration of it, the tool in God's hand as well. So think of yourself as the Jew. You're going into Babylon captivity. You're thinking it's all over. It's all over. I mean, all of the plans and all of the promises of God that he was going to work for his people, it, it didn't, you'd, be, you'd be in great confusion at that point. But what did Israel do while they were in Babylonian captivity? They established the synagogue. And the purpose for the synagogue was not for sacrifice or anything like that. It was simply for the teaching of God's word. And as we're looking at Isaiah right now, your Isaiah is their Isaiah that they could look to these things. And think what would happen if you were a Jew, you're in Babylonian captivity, six, close to 70 years now, and all of a sudden you heard that there was a siege down in Babylon. Down in Babylon. And, and as that siege came, they were able to conquer the Babylonians, and now there's this man in rule, King Cyrus. Just, just think of the magnitude of that knowledge and understanding of God said he was going to do it, and God is doing it, and to see those things come to pass. Now, I don't know of any names that I can think of in the New Testament that we'd be looking for other than Antichrist, although I'm not looking for Antichrist, I'm looking for Jesus Christ. But I still have these great promises, and I still see God's word coming to fruition even in our day. And, and that should strengthen your resolve in the truthfulness of God's word and the mind of God who continues to be mindful of you today. We should be a people strengthened. Again, from the microscope to the telescope, well, man has tried to use those things to dispel God, but in his wisdom he's become a fool, and we see the hand of God in these things. And Darwin, back in his day, they didn't understand the magnitude of what a cell was, just even a single cell. They thought it was a simplistic thing. 
But now we see all of the detail, not only in the cell and DNA and so on and so forth, and all of these things that the fingerprints of God is all over it. And so in his authorizing of King Cyrus, God gives us four reminders of his authority. And the first thing that we need to see is his ability. God's got the ability to alter our future, to keep our nation, and to watch over our lives. A reminder that he formed Israel in the womb of Egyptian bondage. Look at verse 24 again. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb. There was Israel, this nation that was led into Egyptian captivity, thinking back of how God worked, because again, he's speaking to Jews that are going to be going into captivity, speaking of how God delivered Israel, and really not delivered, but established Israel from the womb of Egyptian bondage. This is the world, a place of violence, a place of hammering and tearing and testing, a place where you get a taste of godlessness, and the Jew would be reminded of their former predicament in the book of Exodus. Now again, this was their godless existence, although God did have his hand upon all things that were going on. But in Exodus chapter 1, verse 11, it says, Therefore they set, this is the Egyptians, set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built Pharaoh's supply cities, Hitham and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, harshness. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and all manner of service in the field. And all of their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. And so that reminds me of just simply my time in the world. Time in the world when it was apart from God and apart from all hope. And the world had its ways, and again, we thought we were free and wild and all of that stuff, but we were in bondage. We were in bondage because, first of all, we were headed towards death. We were in bondage to those things that so easily encapsulate us with various relationships and chemicals and alcohol and all of these things. And so God, God, in order to put a new heart in us, first allowed our old heart to be, well, to be at the mercy of the world but it was through the mercy that was lacking in the world that we saw the magnitude of the mercy of the God who truly is. Think of your life if you're a born-again believer. Look how God used all of those B.C. days to bring you to the cross of Christ. And then understand the change that God occurred, or God caused to occur at the cross of Christ. And see how we can see God's hand as we see the prophecies of the future things. And we see these things coming to pass in the Middle East. We see Israel. Again, what's Israel in the Middle East? It's just this little nation, and who really cares? But God keeps our attention. The whole Middle East, why would we even care as a nation? God stuck the oil there. He stuck the oil there so that we would have our focus there. And as we see these things continuing to process, what it tells me is God's in control. God's in control because he said he was going to use that part of the world and he still does. And we arrogantly look at the Bible and say, where is the United States? And God's sight, the United States is a little flea, a little flea that probably has become a major irritant. But the Lord, the Lord has brought us into his glorious kingdom. God has watched over and he has kept Israel and God continues because it's part of his nature, his great act of redemption in first peter chapter 1 verses 18 and 19 we are to know that we were not redeemed with corruptible things with silver or gold from our aimless conduct received by traditions of fathers you weren't bought back with silver and gold or anything of any kind of worldly value because in the sight of god that's no value again it's all going to burn but you were bought with the precious blood of christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot God came and died for you. And so he's allowed us to go in the hardship and we can yell out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But never forget, he redeemed you. He paid your price. He bought you with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as he's purchased me, he's going to correct me. He's going to keep me. He's going to discipline me. He's going to bless me. And one day he's going to take me. He's going to take me unto himself. 
And so sometimes it feels like you're going to be ready to go under. Sometimes it feels like you're getting rolled over. But keep in mind, you have been redeemed. God looked down upon your simple life and saw value in you and in essence said, I want him. I want her. I want her and I'm going to redeem her. I'm going to redeem him. I'm going to bring them unto myself. Secondly, as a display of his authority, God makes mention of his creation. So the God who is going to work all this out, now keep it in mind, he's telling Israel this, obviously, before the fact. We're just able to look back. But he's wanting them to know the magnitude of what he's able to do, and so God will always bring creation into the equation. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. In the essence, he's saying, I didn't need any help on this. And so often we want to be advisors in the kingdom of God. And God doesn't need any advisors. God just simply asks us to be servants. To be servants, to be obedient once again, to hear the call of God in the direction that he's set for us, and to follow through on that. And as we do that, amazing things happen. You got Peter, he's sitting there fishing one day, and Jesus says, come follow me. And he left it, and he did, and God did amazing things through, again, undeniably, a very simple life. And if we honestly look at our lives, and we're truly honest, we'll realize we're just a bunch of simple people. There's nothing really invo uh, major involved here. But it's the Lord who chooses to use simple people for his great glory, because it's he, his glory is displayed through that. So we take creation for granted. Sometimes, truly take time to meditate upon creation, just to truly look at what God has done, to truly examine yourself and in, in the wonder of, of a human body and the reality that I take in oxygen, and this has always gotten me, I take in oxygen and I produce carbon dioxide, and then God decides, well, we'll plant trees, and they'll take in the carbon dioxide, and they'll produce oxygen. And as these trees thrive, they'll produce fruit, and man will eat of this fruit, and man will care for the trees. And we just see a harmony, and this is just a small part, obviously, a harmony in all of creation. And it's as if somebody sat there and divinely figured it all out. And then we, in our ignorance, because we worship, we as a people, worship the human intellect, we've kind of thrown that all out the door. And then we kind of try and piece it together our way. And there's just no way that you can tell me there's not intelligent design that is involved here. And I always whittle it down to male and female. Now, they say, the evolutionists say, that it was what the, uh, the goo to the zoo to you, man as he crawled out of the goo, became an animal, and then became a human being. I don't remember who first said that. It wasn't, wasn't me, I'm stealing it from somebody. Now, let's just say, okay, there's two proteins that got together and produce a cell and everything, and then at some point, something crawled out of the gunk. Now, how would it be possible, let's just say it's possible for one thing to crawl out of the gunk, but apparently many things had to crawl out of the gunk in order to populate the earth like it did. But let's just say that one thing popped out, and then that same event happened and something else popped out. How could they, when one happened to be male and one happened to be female, how could they be so closely, even so necessary for one another? I mean, just the physical act of reproduction, you know, that's just an amazing thing. How could that just happen in two separate things? And, and then not just the physical act, but also the emotional act, that man would so need woman and woman would so need man. And then we enter in, now we start going the opposite way and we start descent, this disassembling this, at least in our minds, and we start destroying marriage, and we do even today, as silly as it is, God brings human wisdom to foolishness, we're now even destroying what is a male and a female, not able to really even define that anymore, and you really see the direction that we are heading. In creation, we see the authority of God, we see the beauty of God, and we see the majesty of God. Psalm 19, 1 through 4, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. 
their line has gone throughout all of the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set the tabernacle for the sun. So again, the fact of the matter is God is in the details. He's in the speed of the earth and its rotation. He's in the speed of the earth as it goes around the sun. He's in the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun. He's in the rain that falls or even the rain that doesn't fall. God is in all of the details of creation and His glory is displayed through it all. Thirdly, God displays His authority by frustrating the worldly wise. Verse 25, who frustrates the signs of the babblers and, the divine, and drives the diviners mad, who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolishness. We saw the lesson that Pharaoh's magicians got. Just think of those guys. This is their well-being. They're serving their king, Pharaoh. And now all of a sudden, one mightier than him. They're representatives of the false gods of Egypt. And we know that it was probably the devil that worked through them and gave them certain abilities. But nonetheless, that's their job. And so you've got all of these plagues that are coming on, and these plagues are attacking the false gods of Egypt. And in Exodus chapter 8, verses 18-19, through 19, the magicians are trying to come up against these things. It says, now the magicians so work with their enchantments to bring forth lice. It's like, what? Do we need more lice? Have you ever thought, we need some lice around here. Lice is usually something you want less of. Matter of fact, it's so bad that when God decided to come up with a plague, one of the plagues he came up with was to plague men with lice. But what's pro the problem is you've got the wisdom of the world. Well, it's become foolishness, and the best they're trying to do is to duplicate that and make more lice. Now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice on man and beast. Then the, Pharaoh, uh, the magician said to Pharaoh, now they're finally coming to an understanding. This is the finger of God. Now, when they say the finger of God, more than likely they're talking about Moses' staff because he would use that staff when, when these plagues were coming. But they're recognizing this is something greater than us. This is something that we're unable to confront or to thwart. This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh, the world, his heart grew hard and he did not heed them just as the Lord had said. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 21, considering wisdom. Corinth was in, the, in Greece of his day, and it was the center of all human wisdom. He's asking, where is the wise? Where is the person who studies? Where has it gotten him? Where is, has it given him an understanding of the meaning of life? Man, through his intellect, is he able to develop that? Where is the scribe? Now, the scribe there was more of a bean counter, and the idea behind a scribe as it's used here is the person who tallies all the spoil of war. Uh, so man's intellect wasn't able to accomplish anything. How about man's power as nation goes against nation and wars go and people die and, 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 and the spoil is collected? So what has that ever gotten man? Where is the disputer of this age? Speaking of, well, in our day, they would be the talking heads that we see on TV, all this spewing that is going on. Again, you've got Fox News telling you everything that's right. You've got CNN telling you that everything that's left, and you've got everybody in between. And all of, we live in this day that there's this, this constant raging that's going on. Facebook and you know people posting all these other things and all of these blogs, no accountability. Where is the dispute? What, what have they accomplished? What have they accomplished? What, what has Fox accomplished? What has CNN accomplished? What has anybody ever accomplished? You know, as far as all this ranting and raving that's going on. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now, the gospel is not foolishness, but to the world it is. And it's just the simplicity of the gospel that has changed lives. Wisdom of man, it has never changed the life for the better. Wars, you know, we so desire peace to such a degree we're willing to go to war. What kind of sense does that make? Talking about making the wisdom of this world into foolishness. And then again, the disputer of this age, has it made anything better? For anybody, anywhere? 
It's always been about the gospel. It's been about God's people moving forward in obedience. And it's the simplicity of that that makes all the difference. Fourthly, God displays his authority as he backs up his word, verses 26 through 28, who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited to the cities of Judah, <clears throat> you shall be built. Now, just think of them as they're in Babylonian captivity, and now God had told them that they're going to go into captivity, but now God is also telling them through Jeremiah, but also here in Isaiah, that they're going to be released, and, and again, Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. So as they're going off into captivity, they're thinking, what's happened with all of God's promises? It's all for naught, but God never leaves man through his word without hope. And I will raise, her, raise up her waste places, verse 27, who says, who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. Who says to Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all of my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. And lo and behold, about 150 years later, 538 B.C., those exact words came to pass. And there was no other reason that King Cyrus would have done this other than God had laid it upon his heart. He had no reason to do this. Looking in Ezra, Ezra is what speaks of the event in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Now in the first year of Cyrus, this is one of the first things that he did, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Remember, Jeremiah was the one who prophesied that they were going to be in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, so this is the hand of God working through this instrument, working through this man. Why is God having to do this? Because his intended instrument, Israel, had been disobedient and now God is working through the world. Verse 2, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So just as God said it was going to happen, it's happening. We look back and we see God's word confirmed, but even more than that, we see God's future prophecies and God's future word that, well, just as God was able to do it back then, why isn't he able to do it today? Well, of course he is. So there's going to be an Antichrist. I personally believe, and you can take this or you can leave it, it means nothing more than a hill of beans, really, but I personally believe that the Antichrist is alive today. He's alive and out there today. He may not be, but I believe that he is. And Christ, Christ could come back at any time. Again, it would not invalidate any bit of God's word if Jesus Christ came back today. We see the signs are there. So, after God authorizing Cyrus, we see the achievement that he's going to work through Cyrus. Verses 1 through 4, entering into chapter 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed. Now when he says his anointed here, this is his tool, this is the person that he has chosen to use. Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held. So in essence, this isn't this man doing anything, but this man being used by God. His man whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you 
though you have not known me. And so that fits Cyrus to a T. He, he, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. But he was a heathen. He had no idea of God. And, and this isn't even for the people. This is for Israel's purpose, but not just really Israel's purpose, for the purposes of the promises of God. God is going to use his divine power to see these things come to pass. And so a couple of things here. First, the historian Josephus tells us of a Jewish tradition that says Cyrus read the prophecies spoken of here in Isaiah a year after he conquered Babylon. Is it true? The Bible doesn't say it, so I don't know if it's true or not, but that doesn't detract. It's very possible somebody told him that, somebody showed him that, that he came aware. Maybe it was Daniel that showed him that, and he realized, and so how does God speak to man? He speaks to man through his word. If Daniel showed him the word of God, that would speak to the heart of this king. And then also, in 1879, archaeologists found the Cyrus Cylinder in Iraq, which is the area of where Cyrus was. This is a ceramic cylinder with Persian writing from the time of Cyrus. It was a sort of foundation capsule, something that was buried in a foundation. It tells how he attributed his success to the false god Marduk. He had this false god that he worshipped, and he said that his success came about by this man. So this would once again go to the legitimacy of God's word because he didn't know God when all of this has happened. Again, the last part of verse 4, I have named you, though you have not known me. Now, it is possible that he came to know God, and he seemed to have. Did Cyrus get saved? I don't know. He seems to have. He very well could have, but this is about God using this man for the purpose of the fulfillment of his word. Then we see God's purpose once again confirmed for those who would be exiled, verses 5 through 8. And again, there's another portion. I've got so many sections of Scripture underlined here for when those false prophets come knocking at your door. But again, all of these are confirming the deity of God. Verse 5, I am the Lord. There is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. And so you've worshipped all these false gods, but I am the God who is doing this work, again, so that Israel would know, that we would look back and understand that He is truly God. And we see God works this way even today. In 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, He speaks of delivering an immoral person, such a one, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. God delivers his people into the hands of the world for the purpose of correction. Then we see the accomplishing of God's plan, specific to this plan, and in general, the planning is the will of God. And without the will of God, where is the, where is the existence of man? And so, it's what it boils down to. God's will is going to pass. Now I want to close here tonight. I think I'm just going to go ahead and close here tonight because it's going to be pretty involved and we, I think we'll go ahead and pick it up again next week so I don't have to keep you here until um, you have to go to work tomorrow. But there's this constant thread that we have been looking at since we entered into chapter 44. I've encouraged those to underline these things when we were going through them, and I'm just going to go back through and read them. God getting the point across. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Going down to verse 8. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declare it? You are a witness. You are my witness. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. And then we just read in chapter 45, verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, but that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no 
other. You look over at verse 21, the mid part, and there is no other God besides me, a just God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Verse 22, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Verse four, or chapter 46, verse 9, remember the former things, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Do you see the point that he's trying to get across? They started searching for other gods. God has allowed all this calamity to, to come apart in their life so that they would learn the simple lesson that God is God, that Yahweh is God. This God who birthed them, this God who has kept them, the God who has delivered them, and the God who is going to work out his plan through them is truly God. And what's our job here tonight, or our reaction here tonight, is simply to submit ourselves to that. There's that which comes up against it, and spoke of a few things, um, evolution and whatnot, what the world has been producing. And again, we have false teachers that will speak of a multitude of gods and all. But the Bible's very clear. There's no other God but the God of Israel, the God of the church, our God today. And it's that God who cares for his people. It's that God who, although he has allowed them to go into captivity, he has redeemed them. And now we have that privilege of understanding the fruition of God's plan through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What occurred upon the cross? Based upon that, what kind of people ought we to be? What kind of people? What, what, what is your reaction to that knowledge today? Each and every one of you will need to make that determination. What kind of person ought I to be today? With the knowledge that there is no other God, but that God has redeemed me and brought me into his service. What is to be my reaction? What is to be my reaction in the home? Am I exemplifying that? Am I exemplifying that belief in my house? What is to be my reaction out in the world, out into the workplace, the school, wherever it might be? Am I exemplifying that? Am I living a life that reflects the reality of these things? I'll leave you with that to consider. Father, once again, we just thank you, Lord, that you have given us these things to truly ponder. That, Lord, yes, you are God, and there truly is no other. And so, Father, I pray that we would be a people that conduct our lives with that knowledge. That, Lord... You have peered into humanity and you entered in so that we would have an understanding of who you are. You came and you displayed your love to such a great degree that you died upon the cross. And Father, you saved us. And if we were honest with ourselves, if we're truly born again, that yes, there was that change that supernaturally occurred in our lives. And truly as you changed us, you are able to keep us until that day that we are in your presence. And Father, if we're honest and if we look at our lives, we'll see that you are the God who has provided. You are the God who has healed. You are the God who has disciplined. You are the God who has brought in great blessings into our lives. And because of that, Father, I pray that you would give us a great spirit of worship, even here in this last song, but even so much more when we leave this place and go about our busy weeks. And so, Father, I pray for those who have come out here tonight that you would watch over them and keep them. I pray, Father, that you would bless them, that you would continue to reveal yourself to them. And I pray, Father, that all of us here would have that heart to serve you this week to the capacity to which you have called us. So again, Father, we just thank you and we praise you for who you are and all you continue to do, that you would be glorified through our simple lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you all stand, please? I had a couple of announcements. Oh, yes, this Thursday we have National Day of Prayer, and so we'll be celebrating the National Day of Prayer getting together and praying for our nation, praying for our schools, and praying for the church. And then next Sunday, next Sunday night, 